Bem, pessoal, é, mais uma vez poder participar aqui dessa sessão. Uh, gostaria de apresentar a vocês a Zia. A Zia que é reconhecida internacionalmente pelo trabalho que ela executa na Forrester. A Forrester também é um, estudo, é um instituto que acho que é interessante todo, todos nós do e-commerce uh, acompanhar, e inclusive uh, é interessante de avaliar uh, o consumo do, dos estudos que eles provêm, além de uma consultoria. Uh, ela tem uma apresentação que basicamente aponta para os próximos cinco anos, tendências do comércio eletrônico, que eu aconselho que todos prestem bastante atenção. Zia, por favor. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Zia Daniel Wigter, and I'm a research director at Forrester Research in New York. If the last hour was really an insider's perspective on what's happening in Brazil, I'm going to be giving an outsider's perspective. I am clearly not Brazilian, but what I do do is look at how e-commerce markets around the globe evolve. And I want to spend the next half hour talking a little bit more about five trends that we see hitting Latin America overall, and in particular, Brazil. Now, there could probably be a hundred different trends that you could talk about, but I'm going to zero in on five that we think will have a significant impact on the market over these next few years. Okay. To start off, I want to put Brazil in a regional perspective. Um, often when we look at different e-commerce markets, there's a tendency to assume that sort of the size of the market correlates with the overall size of the economy. But you can see it's actually quite different in Latin America. It's also different in Asia. Brazil really punches above its weight when it comes to e-commerce. If you look at it compared to Mexico, for example, Brazil is about twice the size of Mexico's economy. Yet, as you can see, it's six or seven times larger when you look at the online retail market. And you'd see a similar dynamic between China and India. E-commerce has just evolved at a different level here as it has in comparison to some of the other markets in the region. There are many reasons behind that. Many in Mexico have uh, studied this issue to figure out what happened here that hasn't happened there yet. I think there are a lot of different reasons. I think the traditional retailers playing a role in e-commerce early on, there being some early movers when it came to e-commerce uh, in this market, have helped propel that market forward. And now we're going to talk a little bit about what those five trends are that we think are really going to have an impact on this market over these next few years. So you can build first one. First of all, category growth. One of the things that uh, we look at on our forecast team at Forrester is how different markets evolve. And one of the things uh, that we see in almost every market around the world is the fact that consumers buy across a greater number of categories online as markets mature. So we'll dive into that in a little bit. Next one, mobile. You can't talk about any uh, trends hitting any e-commerce market today without talking about the arrival of mobile devices, the increasing penetration of mobile devices, both smartphones and tablets. Go ahead. Marketplaces, um, sort of a, a two-fold issue here. One is the arrival of marketplaces as an opportunity for brands to expand their footprint in the region. The second is the arrival of marketplaces in terms of traditional online retailers adding them to their sites. Once again, customer intelligence. In the Brazilian market, there is massive focus on customer acquisition and a lot of data collection, but we're seeing a lot less uh, analysis of the data and use of that data to create actionable uh, insights you know, about your customers and to really drive up those retention rates that haven't been the same focus that the acquisition has been to date. And then one more. Online offline integration. Um, another topic that I've heard talked about in Brazil for many years, yet is in many ways still in its infancy here. Something that is going to change a lot, uh, particularly over, I would say, the next two to three years in this country. So go ahead. Start out by talking about category growth. Uh, we do expect that within the next four to five years, you're going to see consumers purchasing across a much wider variety of categories online. If you build one more. This is our framework that we use to talk about how e-commerce markets evolve. This is true in almost every market in the world. Consumers start coming online generally to communicate when they first come online. You know, 10, 15 years ago, it was used email chat. Now it's to use social networks in addition. They then start to engage in things like online banking. 
travel tends to be one of the first purchases uh, made electronically in almost every market. Some markets are very heavily dominated by, uh, by travel still. You know, a market like India, Mexico still has a large percentage of total transactions that go to travel. And then, oh, no, oh, back one. There we go. Um, only after this first uh, stage of purchases do we get to purchase of comparable goods, the first physical goods purchased online. These are things like computer hardware, books and media, consumer electronics, those readily comparable goods that are going to be the same regardless of the seller chosen. And only after those types of products are purchased online do you get to this final stage where the more subjective purchases start being made. This is apparel, this is grocery, this is beauty. Things with a heavy touch and feel component to them. You, know, you want to you know, squeeze the melons or try on the, um, the clothing or makeup before buying. That really is the final stage of e-commerce. You know a market is mature when all of these different types of purchases are being made online. And if you do one more build, what I think is interesting is looking at the market in Brazil today as compared to where it's going to be in 2018. Now this is based on our forecast looking at the percentage of the market that comes from different categories. And you can see the sort of dark blue slice there, which is uh, the phase four categories, those subjective purchases, are going to be an increasing percentage of the total. In fact, um, once you, uh, this doesn't have all of the phase uh, four, it doesn't include grocery, for example. But when you get to a final stage of the market, apparel tends to be one of the biggest categories purchased online. And that is absolutely happening in this market, but it still has huge growth opportunity going forward. The online channel share of apparel is quite small compared to where it's going to be over the next few years. And as I said, that wave is well underway, but it doesn't yet look like what we see in a UK or the US. In Brazil today, I believe it's been in, know, 5 to 10% of the market is apparel, according to our forecasts. In you know, a, you know, a very mature market with low growth rates like the US or the UK, it's generally in the 15 to 20% range. So huge runway ahead for things like apparel, like beauty, like grocery as well. Go ahead. Next trend, mobile. Um, the higher penetration of both smartphones and tablets is very much happening today, but I feel like the real momentum is still ahead. The, um, there have been investments in mobile, but they pale in comparison to what you're going to see within just a few years' time. So go to the next slide. First thing to keep in mind as you think about how you're going to target these mobile consumers is really how your consumers are, how your customers are using mobile devices because it's not the same. Um, we actually have a mobile mind shift index that we use at Forrester that helps companies understand exactly how their customers want to use these devices, how they are using them today, and then how they're going to interact with your brand. Can you speak a little bit closer to the mic? Okay, okay. Oh, have to get much closer. There we go. Um, so um, when you're thinking about customers, you need to understand, are they ready for the different, uh, the different offerings that you are thinking of providing to them? Are they using mobile devices just to communicate, or are they already starting to transact on those devices? What are they missing in relation to, you know, um, to your brand, to the experience you want to provide? This is one example from the hotels industry, which for a long time was quite far behind the airlines industry when it came to mobile devices. The airline industry had done a very good job of figuring out how mobile can play a key role in terms of you know, helping customers throughout their travel experience. And hotels just hadn't. You, know, you still were checking in at the front desk. You still had to wait in line. It, you, know, you weren't using your mobile device to the fullest. Recently, however, there have been great strides made by you know, a number of players in the hotel industry going even as far as being able to use your mobile device as a key for your room. Again, really understanding those customer pain points and not just saying, you know, we're going to allow you to book your room on a mobile device because that may not be the most useful thing to your customer base. Oh, go back. Nope, go back one. Nope, back one. We'll just finish up. Um, just the last point on this slide is if you are a retailer, you need to really understand your customers to 
understand if they are going to be looking to you, know, to you as a retailer to help them make purchases on their mobile device? Are they looking to locate your stores? Are they looking to locate things within your stores? Are they looking for coupons? You need to understand this because it's not going to be the same for every customer and every retailer out there. Take the time to understand this and don't just mill, build a mobile shop that looks like everyone else's because you may be missing great opportunities to connect with your customer. So if we go to the next one. Another, yep, you can build uh, two here. So one more. Yep, there we go. Um, another piece of the market that really hasn't gone, uh, gotten underway just yet is the investment in tablets. So um, you're seeing some retailers here focusing on tablets, but for the most part, investment is still pretty small compared to what it will be going forward. Here I want to just highlight what we saw between 2011 and 2012 in terms of investment in smartphones. So at that point in time, it was sort of similar from one year to the next. But if you build here in terms of what happened with tablets, two more builds. Two more, thank you. So in 2011, you had tablet penetration in the US that was similar to what it is in Brazil today. It was around the 10% mark uh, in terms of the consumers who had tablets within the country. Now, in the US, tablet penetration almost doubled between 2011 and 2012, but you can see there's a massive shift in investment beyond that 10% mark. And that's what we're getting to in Brazil today. Yet, I don't hear a lot of retailers yet talking about optimizing their offerings for tablets, even though the penetration is increasing significantly. So we expect that this trend is one that is really going to start to hit over the next few years. Okay. Marketplaces. In this case, yeah, you're seeing marketplaces around the globe becoming a much more popular way for brands to, you know, to sell online as a point of entry into new markets, as well as a way for retailers to diversify their revenues and to keep customers on their sites. So if you go to the next one, uh, go back one, it should be a build. Nope, okay, sorry, didn't have the build. You're seeing, unfortunately, we have Mercado Livre in the back here, but you're seeing companies like Mercado Livre offering brand stores uh, as a point of entry for brands both coming into the market as well as those within the market expanding their footprint. This has been, I think, until now, a missed opportunity in Latin America. You've seen this you know, around the world, a point of entry into China, into Japan, into the US marketplace. Marketplaces have a huge audience. They understand the local market. They're a great partner for brands looking to expand that footprint. At the same time, another trend that we're clearly seeing here is the number of online retailers now offering marketplaces on their site. Again, to expand the available inventory for the customers shopping on their site, to diversify revenues, and again, to make sure that shoppers stay with you, that they don't leave your site to go make a purchase elsewhere. Now, if we look at sort of best practices, particularly in relation to this first opportunity, go one more, I would say, China is the one place to look sort of uh, first and foremost. Brands expanding into China almost always at least evaluate whether they should sell on Tmall today. Um, this is an example of a Burberry store on Tmall, which was launched quite recently. Um, Tmall is working very hard to make sure that they uh, overcome the reputation that they have as a source of discounts and a source of counterfeits by uh, looking to bring on some luxury brands. Uh, and they are getting much more elegant. You know, the website for Burberry on, or the store for Burberry on Tmall is sleek, it's elegant, it uh, sells full-priced items. If you look at almost any of the big brands selling on Tmall, they're quite impressive. And it's very different than what you saw just a few years ago on, on Tmall. Now, they're in an enviable position. You know, Alibaba, Tmall's owner, com uh, controls 50% of the B2C market in the world's largest e-commerce market. So there's a lot that you can do with that. But I think they're a good example to look to in terms of a marketplace offering a really pretty compelling customer experience and one that will still be different from your own website, 
but it still offers the customers a lot of what they're looking for and a lot of the tools and features that really resonate within that market, making it a great point of entry for brands and a great way for brands to expand their footprint beyond just their own website. And I think you're, over time, going to see the same thing happening here in Brazil. You're going to see more brands looking to marketplaces as a way to be available at every location that customers might touch. You know, no longer is it okay only to have your own website, but rather you're going to want the mobile site. You're going to want the marketplace option. This is something that's just really starting in the region today and will, I think, continue quite a lot. Next one. Number four, customer intelligence. Um, as I mentioned before, we have seen a, you know, a large focus here on acquisition. You know, companies are spending extensively to get customers to come to their sites. They're spending on different marketing tactics. And that's absolutely the right thing to be doing, but you ultimately need to pair that with acquisition, I mean, with retention tactics as well. And this is a combination of both market research to give you more qualitative insights, as well as investing in analytics, investing in better data collection, as well as data analysis. My sense is here talking with a lot of the retailers that there's a ton of data being collected, but in terms of really, you know, really synthesizing that data, really analyzing it and taking it to the next level to be able to retain customers, we're still at the beginning of that happening. If you go to the next uh, slide here, um, one argument that I hear in Brazil is that it's just too early, um, that we're still at a phase of development where retailers need to focus on acquiring customers. You know, the market isn't mature enough. But I think it's interesting if you look at uh, Flipkart in India. And India is about a you know, $3 billion market. It's not $20 billion like Brazil is today. But their CEO um, you know, went out very publicly saying, we're going to shift our focus away from scale, away from just getting bigger to getting more intelligent. And I don't hear that a lot from retailers here today. I haven't heard many say we're going to do a, you know, almost a wholesale pivot to customer intelligence. Now, another argument I hear is it's just too expensive for us to do. It's not what our investors might be looking for. But if you build again here, in their case, it very much was what investors were looking for. You know, Flipkart became quite well known because they just raised a billion dollars for a market that is worth about $3 billion. So clearly, people think that Flipkart is doing something right in India by taking this greater look at customer intelligence and becoming a much more intelligent retailer to counter the competition. As you start to grow your business, Bear in mind, you need to add analytics professionals. Yeah. And this is hard in Brazil. I, I hear from many companies that it's very, you know, very challenging to find seasoned uh, professionals in the analytics field. I'm sure that is true. What that means is you need to start investing in training if you're not going to be able to hire all of these people. Because look at those numbers increase as you go to over $150 million in online revenues. You, more, you know, almost triple the number of analytics professionals. At least that's what most businesses have done to date. Because as you start to get bigger, you need that focus. You need qualified individuals who can help you make that leap, who can turn the, that data turn, uh, into insights that your business can use. So keep this in mind as you think about how to scale your business. You can't skimp on this area. You absolutely need to be making this investment. And then finally, online, offline integration, a topic that's been discussed here for many years. Um, I think that over these next few years, you're going to see retailers starting on this journey. And we can build one here. What do I mean by online, offline integration? This is a survey that we did of global e-business and channel strategy professionals, you know, global e-business, e-commerce leaders, and where, what they were planning to implement of all these different capabilities. And you can see things like in-store inventory being really critical, uh, being a key component of what they're looking to do online. In-store email capture, associate ordering in-store, 
These are things like you know, your associates having iPods and iPads. Um, ship from store, huge trend at the moment. Um, you know, a large number of different retailers investing in that. Sort of a win-win situation in that you both uh, reduced the number of times your customers are going to receive an out-of-stock notice when they look at products. And it also allows you to sell discounted uh, inventory to consumers. In fact, in the US, at Macy's, for example, if I'm in New York City and I order from them, the chance is just as great that I'll receive something shipped to me if I order on Macy's.com from a store in California as I might get uh, from the store in New York. If that shirt that I'm ordering is most likely to be discounted in California, they, th they then start to calculate the difference in shipping costs as compared to the, uh, you know, the difference in the price that that shirt would be sold at. And they're getting very, very smart about these things. So now uh, the retailers across the US, across Europe, and I think increasingly here, are looking to this as a way to, you know, to leverage your stores, not only as a distribution channel, but as a way to get rid of that merchandise before it has to be discounted. So a win-win situation. You can read through, oh, go back. Uh, I was just gonna say, you can read through uh, the rest of this list here, but there are a large number of areas of investment in this area. Okay, good. Um, this is one of my favorite examples of companies doing a really good job of online, offline integration. This is IKEA, who's doing something here um, that is you know, increasingly common, which is giving you know, in, uh, information on what's available in the store. But what I love is that they're also projecting what's available in their stores. So we see this, which is helpful. You know, I'll, you know, it really doesn't matter when I go. I'll still be able to pick up this product. But if you build again, yep. This is even more helpful. This is, if I go today, I'm not gonna have this product in my local store. I'm gonna have to come back again. But if I go back on Wednesday or Thursday, they're gonna have 120 of these items. So it really is not in my best interest to travel today. And I can even plan. I can even say, okay, I'm gonna take a different way home on Wednesday and I'll be able to do these other things because I know that I will need to stop at Ikea on my way home because that day they'll have this product in stock. Um, the one thing to keep in mind with online offline integration is that it's not cheap. And if you look at what it costs some of the big retailers, you can build uh, a couple times here. Neiman Marcus investing $100 million in their omni-channel uh, project. Belk investing $200 million over several years, again. DSW investing uh, $10 million in one year alone. This is not going to be true of every retailer out there, but I think this gives you a sense for the level of investment that some of these big retailers are having to make to reach this omni-channel future. It's not a one-time project. It is an ongoing uh, journey toward an omni-channel future. And we suggest that companies pick you know, one area to focus on up front. Don't try to map this all out in a you know, five-year plan, because in five years, who knows what's going to be happening? Companies that started their five-year plan five years ago had no idea that mobile was gonna have the impact on the market that it has today. And they're having to completely rethink you know, their plans to make sure that mobile is a component of it. Um, so as you think about your omni-channel future, I think the time, though, to start is today because it is going to take you a number of years and it is going to take you know, pretty significant investment in order to get there. So anyone who hasn't started today is going to be left behind because once consumers get a taste of these omni-channel options, once one or two of the big traditional retailers starts going to in-store returns, starts providing that inventory information online, starts allowing you to you know, send things to the store uh, near you or a location near you for free, it starts to become pretty compelling and their expectations of other retailers also rises. So build uh, more. So just to summarize these five trends, and I would love to hear from the audience afterward if there are trends you think are gonna have a big impact that I didn't touch upon. But to talk about these five just in summary. First, consumers in Brazil are going to start buying across a wide variety of categories online. 
There are no cultural barriers that exist in any country when it comes to consumers buying any of these later stage purchases online. I've heard in so many countries that consumers here won't buy grocery online or apparel online because people like trying them on too much. Yeah. But we see in every market these categories do shift online, it just takes time. Second, the mobile revolution has, really has yet to hit here. I know that there are some retailers that are seeing, what is it, 16% of revenues coming from mobile devices. I think more typical is kind of the 5, 10% range here. Um, that's going to shift very quickly. In the US today, we actually see a two to one ratio of um, e-commerce e -commerce revenues being driven by tablets as compared to smartphones. It's about 10%, uh, sorry, 20% tablets this year, and I think 9% of total e-commerce revenues that will be driven by smartphones. That revolution hasn't uh, hit here to the same degree, but I think it really will in the very near future. Next up. Marketplaces will be incredibly, uh, increasingly important for brands. They will uh, become a point of entry into the Brazilian market for global brands. There will be a way for brands to expand their footprint within the country. And there will also be a way for retailers to diversify their revenues. And that is well underway here, but I think is going to be even more critical within two to three years. Next. Retailers must start to focus more time and resources on customer intelligence. Start that pivot that we've seen in some other countries to really understanding your customers and creating a customer experience that speaks to them and their needs. And then finally, last one. Online offline integration will be a critical differentiator, particularly um, when it comes to competing against the web only players. This is a key thing for traditional retailers looking to remain competitive and provide something that the web only players just can't. So one of the main reasons for that significant investment uh, in the US. And then finally, if you can help us, we would ask of all of the retailers in the audience to help us identify the trends that are going to continue to hit the Brazilian market. Um, at Forrester in the US, we have done a lot of work with different e-commerce organizations to understand the KPIs in the market. We've worked with shop.org on the B2C side. We've worked with internet retailer on the B2B side. We are trying to better understand the Brazilian market, and we are uh, launching a survey today that asks about things like average order values, return rates, uh, conversion rates, uh, e-commerce team sizes, uh, the, uh, you know, what these different teams are comprised of, how many people in different divisions. It's completely anonymous. We ask at the end if you want to give an email address so you can receive uh, a write-up of all the data in a report. We're glad to send that to, you know, to anyone who takes part in the survey. But we're really excited to try to get more quantifiable information about the market in the same way that we have uh, in the US and also uh, in Europe through our Forrester relationships. And we're very honored to have uh, Viviani uh, helping us out with the survey. So would appreciate any and all of your participation. Thank so, you, thank Zia. You. Uh, pessoal, esse link da pesquisa já está... Palmas.